So uh, the way we've set it up is uh, the yes case will go first. It'll be uh, 10 minutes. Uh, the no case will then go second. They have 13 minutes because they not only uh, mention their case, but they also, get a, they also get an opportunity to rebut the yes case. And then after that, the yes case will have a three-minute chance to just do a rebuttal to the rebuttal. <laughs> and then it opens up to the audience for questions and answers from both sides. 13. Now that irrigation plan that they'd come up with was to re-green the oval at the side of line and primary. Along here was the boundary line that they cut. This is the new irrigation lines that they were going to put down. And that's what it was going to look like. So, 42% of the oval was going to be cut off at the time. It was going to be irrigated originally. It was going to be fenced and then it was going to be rezoned for development for Lyman Primary as a future proofing of the land so that Lyman Primary could double in size. At the time, I turned around and said, if you cut the oval here, you'll destroy the ability to have large-scale playing fields. And this was the implication at the time. So, what had actually happened the executives, at the end, turned around and saw the logic of what they were doing was wrong. They actually agreed to move the lines back in relation to what they were actually going to do. And so, moving forward, this is the existing car park. This is the small Tams car park. This is the history of the discussions. We worked with them for two years on a design. The original concept was supported by Andrew Barr and Joy Birch. During the two years we didn't interfere with the way they spoke to their schools. Found out later that they didn't, but that's another issue. Um, at the DA stage, we actually hit the first time we realised that the community actually wasn't happy with the outcome. Now, I actually sat down with Shane Rattenbury. We had a meeting two weeks prior to the November meeting last year, and he said there's community discontent with the actual submission. As Deputy Chair of the NCCC, it was actually impossible for me to run two different lines, and so I agreed with him two weeks prior to the November meeting that if the community didn't like what was happening, I'd pull the DA, which, after the November meeting, we did. Now, we didn't have to pull the DA, we could have run the timeline, but we did. Then what we did is have a look at the proposal and tried to build in ideas that had come through from the Line and Community Association that Dennis and I had been speaking of. So we wanted to future-proof it for potential rebranding of Sutherland's Creek. We looked at playgrounds, we looked at barbecues, we looked at uh, paths. The only thing we didn't do is run a connection path round through there in a circuit, which was one of the suggestions. But that's what we actually came to. That turned into this, which was two fully supported playing fields. Now TAMS released the land that goes through that line there into this arrangement and we're happy for us to extend the actual playing field into TAMS land. TAMS were going to surrender the car park at the front and uh, the Education Department had actually surrendered their leases in this corner and took out a triangle and surrendered it into this proposal. Uh, we were going to have two outdoor hard courts here for playing, a multi-court here, and the building that caused all the controversy in relation to what we were going to do. Looking at the design of that building, what we ended up uh, doing is for the playing fields, we cut off a section with independent uh, showers, toilets, change rooms, so that the actual facility here could be rented out independent to this facility here, which meant that sporting groups could play by day or night, um, whilst we actually used this main area here for Brindabella, which was the subject of an $800,000 grant from the Commonwealth Government. Now, let's have a look at the real issues. The real issues are the existing car park is 10%, the sporting fields are 89%, the Tams car park is 1%. Take into consideration the fact that the Tams land was put into the deal. It makes our existing car park 8% of 
Tams car park 1%, the sporting fields 91%. Overlay what we were proposing, we were talking about a 10% increase in area, taking into account the area that the actual pavilion was going to sit on, and increasing this car park area to incorporate a kiss and drop for both schools along here and additional parking, retaining 81% of the playing fields. The big factor in that, the playing fields are going to be re-greened and preserved for the future, which they're not now. But having said that, let's dispel some myths. Brenda Beller is a not-for-profit organisation. Every single dollar is reinvested into the kids. The board rescued the school from closure 15 years ago. Not one of us gets paid. We donate our time and have done for 15 years. BCC was going to spend $1.5 million on re-irrigating the oval um, and actual uh, the kiss and drop at the front of the car park. Our primary focus, un unlike all the myths that have been told, our focus was how do we physically accommodate Brenda Bella and Lionel Primary doubling in size. The most important bit here was how do we actually build the facility while we're actually got 800 kids at the school. So you actually have to develop um, <coughs> You have to actually develop the actual infrastructure at the same time as having the kids operational. So, add to that the fact that the Morris Group was planning a twin eight-storey tower of 300 apartments on the Wine and Motor Inn. Sorry, that was too loud. <laughs> on, the, <laughs> on the Wine and Motor Inn, we had serious congestion and problems with everyone in their urban people movers parking and humping the road in left, right and centre everywhere. So that was the consideration for the joint car park because this is congested twice a day. Now, it's interesting, that uh, feature there from the Line and Community Association, that water park, was one of the most highly contested things that the government just went ahead and did without community support, which is interesting that it's used as a motive. But this is the actual facts of what Shane gave me in a letter last night. And that was, there's 679 uh, responses, 421 objecting. That means 90% of the 4,000 line and residences didn't comment. In our situation, we had 258 submissions. Given that we come from predominantly a two-parent run environment into for households, that means that we roughly had 43% of our 1,200 parents respond. Now, on that basis, that... Those sporting fields, that infrastructure, and that sporting facility to be hired to the community after hours and weekends is what everyone just rejected and Shane just threw out the window. So, um, the Oval will stay a Brindy patch because we were the ones that were driving it with funding um, and money, and the government told us repeatedly they have no cash. So. I welcome the fact that uh, the community has spoken and I just pray that uh, in 10, 20 years' time they do something with the other. And I'm done. That's good. Yeah. Oh, I'll switch this baby off. So, um, yeah. This, um, <laughs> normally this gets turned on first. Which is much more this, this won't count in the uh, time. Have <laughs> 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 uh, we gone through that? Well, on. I mean... Have <coughs> we gone through the correct process? It'll, it'll, it'll just... No, but it's, this is supposed to be on first. It'll get there. It'll go and take a bit Let's get in there. No, there you are.
Okay, what I'm here to do on behalf of the people in the LCA, the Long Community Association, is to present the yes case for why we, are be, why we have been concerned, not only about the uh, Rindabella Christian Education Limited proposal on the Oval, but about the suburb as a whole over time. And this has a fair bit to do with managing change. What we seek to do as a community association is foster an inclusive place for all who live, work, learn and play in our suburb. And that's really, really important to us. And I'd emphasise the all bit. We aim to constructively cooperate with all stakeholders to ensure, assure, ensure that Lyman remains livable and lovable. It's a catchphrase that we've got and it won't go away, and I think it's a very important one, that a suburb be livable and lovable. As, as our city grows, development pressures are emerging that will bring inevitable change. And our city is growing, and there are development pressures. That's not to say we're against them, I just think we need to plan for them. The densification of dwellings along north, on the North Horn Transit Corridor which incidentally is one kilometre wide. Now for those of us that live in Lyman, that takes in the Lyman Shopping Centre, it takes in Brigolow Street, and it goes a bit up the hill beyond that. So just to give you some idea of what this transit corridor is, we don't exactly know yet what the government proposes, but we do know that they have commissioned a study to change to suit North One Avenue as being a major transit corridor. Whether it has a metro or a, tra or a tram, or whether it has buses is really not the point. The point is it is a major transit corridor that goes out to Gungal. That's the issue. Development here and there is much more to come. It's already here, and you can see that's a picture of the Axis Apartments. That's the start. On North One Avenue, the Axis Apartments and the adjacent MacArthur and the apartments adjacent to MacArthur House, the sort of the new black ones that have just gone up. I don't think they're even occupied yet. There's 100 apartments in that, and there's 350 in Axis. That gives us some indication of what's coming. A developer is proposing more multi-storey apartment towers in the old line of motor in. It's on Mowat Street, which would be good if I could spell it. Um, uh, it's, um, it's bordering uh, Brindabella Christian College and, and the college has some real concerns and we agree that uh, if it's in the order of 8 to 10 storeys, these ones are at least 10, uh, there's going to be some overshadowing effects and there's going to be some overlooking effects on Brindabella Christian College. And we, we're probably all aware of some of the issues associated with that. So there's problems. Uh, the ACT government proposes increased population density along the, nor the Northbourne Transit Corridor, indicating that the Axis Motel model will eventually extend south along Northbourne Avenue, the Axis Apartments, I mean. Now, if you can picture along Northbourne Avenue and the line of sight, that in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, that sort of thing could be going down there. What that means, and I've done a few calculations on this, that if exactly that much land with that many apartments went all the way down, that would increase the population in the sector to the east of Sullivan's Creek 20-fold. That's a lot. That's 20 times the population, not 20% more. What we're interested in is quality living apartments. The people living in those apartments are our neighbours, and the ones that are to come will be our neighbours. The children will be going to our school, which will have to grow to accommodate them. And it's mandatory for public schools to accommodate people who live in the area. The people who live in those apartments end up with a small balcony, and that photo is a photo of the open space at the Axis Apartments. If that was translated, can anybody imagine how healthy it's going to be to live in those sort of places? if we lose our major parks that are right near them. There are many studies by the Hart Foundation, many governments around the world, we've had a good look at all of them, 
or many of them, should I say, it takes a year to do all of them, and around the world that uh, state the critical need for adequate, quality, open green space close by for the health and the well-being of the residents. And this is one of the things that we really hang our hat on. Open green space is particularly important for residents in the medium high density populations, and that photo tells you why, as opposed to our traditional 700 square metre block with a back out in the front yard that you can play some cricket in if you're raising a family. That's why we're so passionate about preserving the open space we have. In line of our neighbourhood oval, oval lies right in the middle of these future apartment blocks and the three schools. And the schools are critical, I think, and so does the LCA, to the future of our um, community. The recent development proposal by the Christian, the Brindle Valley Christian Education Limited, did involve the subleasing of a total of about 23% of our Lyman Park to build a sports pavilion, sports courts and large car park. And Greg has just explained some of the history and some of the, the concepts of that. Recent development proposals, I'm oh, sorry, uh, this caused great alarm uh, to the community because we could see that we're going to lose what we've got now with the community we've got, let alone what's coming in the future. That's why the residents objected to public land being subleased to a private entity at a peppercorn rent. We discussed that earlier a bit this evening, or, or subjects very close to it. Um, being given land to a private entity, regardless of the motivations or the, uh, of the entity, that's not the point. The point is, it's a private entity. And it can be changed. And we've been talking about concessionalisation and deconcessionalisation tonight. The future huge increases in population mean our park becomes far more crucial for the health and well-being of Lyman residents. I've already mentioned that Lyman Primary has a statutory requirement to take in the students. So its growth is almost assured, especially if the population increases go anywhere near what's going to happen. So our concern over this particular development or proposal was that stage one you can see up there in, in the red with the big car park down the side was, was going to take a fair chunk of the oval. Lyman Primary, they've talked to 48% and you've mentioned 42, I'm a bit confused now. Yeah, I, 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 I said 48. They had it accurately. It's 42. It is 42, okay, yes. that's interesting. Uh, that means these figures are wrong because when the government presented this to us, they said 48. So, <laughs> um, what that leaves is a little bit of green in the middle, which basically would be timeshare because Sports and Rec's interest in the proposal was that they would be able to return that land to an irrigated oval. The car park would be fairly vacant at weekends, which would mean it would be available for book sport. Therefore, that entire block would be locked out to the community. Whilst the community grows, it probably won't grow 20 fold because things don't work like that way, but it's going to grow massively. <coughs> so we would have a serious problem. We would have no of, none of that parkland left at, for many hours, even at the weekend and after school. During school, it's definitely not a problem. Um, so it's basically being carved up. And I've already mentioned that bit. So we looked at um, sort of improving community consultation and trying to have a go at that. Didn't work as well as we'd like, but nevertheless, um, uh, what the Lyman community eventually did was they ran a petition. Sorry, not the Lyman community. Uh, very uh, interested residents in Lyman uh, ran a petition. And uh, they got 1,553 residents signing that petition. Sports and Rec weren't 100% happy with that, so they went for a uh, survey, an online survey, which was conducted. The petition results were no 90%, yes 20% of the proposal. The survey that has just closed and Shane's just responded to was no 62%, yes 38%. Fairly convincing figures, I think. 
Uh, in the new low to medium density suburb of Canberra, the, lab, the LDA, which we talked about earlier tonight as well, provided uh, provide residents with extensive open space and, and pretty fabulous facilities. So I, I work in parks and I've seen them. <clears throat> um, they're well lit. It's a commercial arm of the government, the LDA, and it's clearly aware of how to sell blocks of land. And one of the ways of doing it, one of the principal assets that they use is to attract buyers to new suburbs, um, is to provide lovely facilities. The older suburbs, such as Lyon, have even greater need for open space and quality facilities because their density will be so much higher that the parks they have are so much more important. The Lyon Community Association plans to pro prosecute this case in depth before further developments are approved. Hence you can understand their position on the current one that was threatening to take more land out of our own. Look into the future. Lyon Park's only asset in that park at the moment is that <laughs> seat. <laughs> now that's pretty scary. Uh, I tell a lie. There was one more. There was a toilet block there which is a terrific graffiti wall. Thank you. Uh, is that fresh paint on the suit? Uh, no, that hasn't happened yet. There is some talk. We were going to have a bit of a go at picking it up. However, there is a beer bottle there if anybody's thirsty. Um, the, other, uh, the other way to look at things is, is to look out at Franklin. Now, there's a lot of new suburbs, and I actually do the um, certification on a lot of the parks there. And, um, and this is just one small part of a crib. At Franklin. The Community oh, Recreation yeah, Irrigated oh. Park. Community Recreation Irrigated Park. Thank you. Now, yeah. what it is, I'm not sure if it's even open yet. Um, I went in because I was asked to, but um, that's just the playground bit. There's heaps more. There's table tennis tables, there's all sorts, there's a range cage there. It is the most phenomenal thing you've ever well, seen. There's heaps more roads there. <laughs> Less out there than there in here. <laughs> Yeah, that's an interesting point. Yes, yes. Um, so anyway, at the end of the day, what we realise is that the community consultation um, that we had on this proposal for um, the Britain Brother Education Limited to expand the school on the Oval really had some problems. The community meetings uh, everybody walked out a bit embarrassed about. They sent a certain message and they sent a message of no at all three meetings that were held. And so we've started to look at this and say, well, we've got to do this better. It's got to be done better. So um, we've developed, uh, or we've started developing a, a process of community led management of Lyman's open space. And we call in that microcosm. And we're looking for it to be a very bold step forward. And the aims and objectives of it are to promote and provide for the physical and mental health and well-being and development of members of the local community. And that's right in line with um, the Heart Foundation. It's right in line with the, the West Fork publications of this. We also <coughs> want to encourage and promote and facilitate the recreational cultural, social and educational pastimes and activities. So I'm out of time. Uh, that was nearly perfect timing. I missed out by two seconds, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, well, the only other one was to improve the land in such a way as to promote, facilitate and use uh, its use and to achieve the other core objectives. Now, uh, we're developing this. Please feel free to go to lyman.org.au to have a look at more of it, but it is in this gestational stage and the, the intent is to develop a way where anybody who comes in to develop in the suburb understands where people are coming from, has a model to communicate effectively with the community and to not have a repeat of what I think one thing Greg will definitely agree with me on, we don't want a repeat of what's happened on this particular issue. I mean, everybody would just not even go to another meeting. True. And um, it, well, what, they solicited passions from a few people, and it, it, it's, it, it's a bit like we have police to stop just the few from wrecking the whole society of us, you know. 
we just don't go there. We've got to find a better way. And NCCC is supporting that, and this debate is part of that process of looking for a better way. We hope to be part of that process and drive it with microcosm. Thanks, Rob. Um, we're in time? Uh, well, no, we went over time. Oh, you went over time. Anyway, no, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, back to Craig. Yeah. Craig, do you want a warning when, you've got, when you're up to two minutes and you've got a minute to go? Sure. Yeah. No worries at all. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, the process was it, it, it meant to be inclusive to the exclusion of VCC, it turned out in the end, but um, in terms of the development along the corridor and the line of motoring, that's all the train wreck that's actually going to happen. I mean, it, it's coming. Um, we see it now with the government revisiting Section 72 at the moment, and they're going to build the car park and they're just going to mow down less trees is where they're going with it at the moment. Now, when you talk about health and wellbeing, We've got 3,000 children currently in those three schools. So whether it becomes a philosophical argument about who uses the oval and who doesn't actually use the oval, but what it actually comes down to is 3,000 children can use the oval. It's difficult when it's not very green and it's not kept because basically you can, you can do a runner on that oval, hit a piece of grass and sprain your ankle. So basically it is an unsafe environment for the greater part of who is adjoining that oval and use that oval on a daily basis. Now the subleasing, to take away the controversy, we sublease 8% of the oval as it currently stands. That's it. That isn't going away. Eventually that'll get tarred because that's the existing lease. It goes up to 19% on this proposal and what it does, it cuts a 6 metre grass verge and redoes the actual landscape of Brigolo Street. Um, what it comes down to is you can talk about CRIP, that's excellent. We were tipping in five million, the government was going to give a hundred thousand, up to a hundred thousand a year to maintain that regreened oval in perpetuity. What you have done by voting against it is you've turned that into a brindy patch, which it's going to stay, and I'm not sure how well you're going to go with getting a crip up um, and I'm not sure how well it's going to run in terms of dealing with the issues associated with the oval but we actually have a firm commitment from the government and uh, that commitment is now gone. So um, Rob's right, the, uh, the, the way in which the thing was handled, um, the way in which the town meetings were handled, they were meant to be soliciting input for ideas once we actually put the proposal on the table, they didn't turn into that. So they don't work. The town hall meetings simply don't work. So um, I wish the Lonham community really well <laughs> in terms of trying to get something up. But uh, Thanks for your part of it. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I, no, no, didn't feel like it. But anyway, so, so having well, said we that... Want you to feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, um, we agree on, on that at least, and we do. Um, and uh, the decision that Shane made, sadly, um, in my particular opinion, is a political one, but um, it is what it is. Oh, wow. Okay. Thanks, uh, both, everyone. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, one, two, three. some structure for for medium term in 
engagement and negotiation with government. I mean, this, this is just obviously a stuff up. And mm. uh, I think um, what I'm just wondering is, are the, the stakeholders, and one presumably you go over the drain and talk to Lion High as well. I mean, kids from primary school go to high school. <laughs> it's mm. like, you know, it's... Uh, they're all 30 seconds is up. But is, that, is that a question for you? Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. The, ask. The, quest, the question is, is, is the, the, the two uh, people debating have any view as to a medium-term structured negotiation process? Can I? Okay. To answer that, what actually happened, I was surprised at Shane's answer, because what actually occurred was he knew that I'd pushed off the Commonwealth grants into October of next year. So we had until then to come up with a solution. There was no need to come out with that yesterday. That came out yesterday, this debate was on today, um, my personal opinion. But nonetheless, having said that, um, the two sides have different views about how things should be done. The oval was never going to be fenced off, it was never going to be closed off. It was going to have some structured sport on it, right? So the issue translates back to one of the sad things we actually wanted to have ACT Little Athletics go on to the line mobile. Shane, um, from my understanding, is canned that as well. Right? So, um, and I'm trying to get an answer out of his office at the moment because the people that we were working with to organise that basically said that Little Athletics turned cold. So, having said that, I think there is discussion to be had about it. Uh, from our side, definitely. Uh, the sad part about this is that it was um, managed badly in the public meetings, but we weren't in control of that, I can guarantee you that. We also weren't in control of the Education Department's discussion with their own schools. We actually thought, because we've been negotiating for two years, right? So we thought that they'd taken care of their side, and it wasn't the case. That's right, it wasn't. Yeah, okay. Sorry, did you, did you want to... Um, nothing, nothing in particular on that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I guess that just gave both sides to answer. Go ahead if you don't want to. The only thing I might say about it is that um, there seems to be a perception that public open space is for physical, organised, school, active sports. Some of it is. Southwell Park just across the road certainly is. However, I don't know the exact proportion of people who are getting a bit elderly. I do know from Morris Group when we had a meeting here recent, uh, a few months ago um, that they see a lot of downsizers moving into these apartments. That means that, and the health, and also uh, for healthy living, uh, it's, it's not necessary to go kicking a football to have a valid use for a park. There are uses for people to go for a walk. There are uses for people to run with their dog, sit on a chair and just look. And that's a very valid and increasingly important use for public open space. So let's not lock ourselves into a paradigm that only physical sports and little ass and those sorts of activities are the only ones. But even in playground design, I usually provide quite passive sitting, thinking, and imaginative space. This is play, this is between two schools. This three. is an oval between three schools. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and therefore needs a nice big oval to have a lot of physical activity sport. But the same piece of land at the weekend and other times, and even after school's finished, and even during school when they're not out on it, there's quite a lot of people who are getting a bit older who aren't quite so physical, but still get a great benefit from going out into public open space. Can I ask a question? The idea of hiring out after hours and weekends was the government's, yeah. not ours. Absolutely. So, if we both agree not to hire it out... <laughs> that would help a lot. Well, that's so... don't get me wrong. <laughs> that is so dumb. Because the truth of the matter is, we could have said that to the government and they would have agreed with it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I have some sympathy with uh, your, your arguments about open space, especially along the Solomon's Creek corridor. That goes back to what I was saying about the bus layover in, in Turner Parkland. And I also have some sympathy because in Turner Parkland there is um, 
North Oval, which has been fenced by ANU, even though it was unfenced for many years. So there's always the potential it will be fenced in the future. It's an obvious trend. It is. So you have to get some absolute ironclad commitment on that. But no, I think so on the whole, tests. you, you yeah. guys have missed a fantastic opportunity. It's a great shame on the balance. Totally on balance, it's a, it, to, to get a, a, a really good facility. I'm, I'm treasurer of the ANU Sport and Rec Association. And I know how much uh, uh, these things cost to run and, and maintain, and I think it's it's really a shame. And if you can recover it, that it would be it would be in the community's interest. It, these the little athletics and so on will go somewhere else. They'll go to somewhere else in Canberra. It'd be good if it's kept in North Canberra. It seems to me your biggest argument is with the line and primary side of it, because they're no. they're the ones that are going to take up forty two percent of the land for future uh, for future growth out, out of that. It's not the Brindabella College. I've got no uh, relationship with either. But they're they're looking to take eight percent, and the line and primary future development is the 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 other forty two percent. So and that's always going to happen. That that hasn't come off the table. It's not a case of having an argument with any one stakeholder. But what, it's what, about please let me finish. It's about expanding the consideration of the space to take into account to account all stakeholders, including future stakeholders, as in increased population density. It's very important not to just look at things as they are today. Planning is not about yesterday, it's not just about today, it's about the future. That's why master plans are important. That's what we're striving for. We're not striving to say no to anybody per se, we're striving to say let's not allow any development there until a fully constituted community engaged master plan is put in place so that we it's very clear from expert people and from communities exactly what the pressures are coming to a suburb, especially a highly densified inner suburb, which you also have. Yeah. Sorry, Greg, do you have anything? Yeah, that's why you future-proof the Oval, which is what we were trying to do. Because when I met with government three, two and a half years ago, they were going to cut it in half. And so, uh, all credit to the executive sitting in the room, because my exact comment was, in 20 years time, someone's going to look back and go, what idiot made that decision? And then the guys in the room pushed that irrigation plan I showed you back about six metres, right, so that we could actually get those playing fields sorted out. <clears throat> now, you know, at the end of the day, it was a future-proofing plan for the actual oval to re-green it and have the government pay to keep it green. That was the plan. Okay. Um, sorry, Carol. Well, my question was actually about the green part, the irrigation part. Where, and I, um, I think I'm then feeling more confused. I thought from your presentation that it. You guys were providing irrigation, but then you just said the government was providing no, no, the no, irrigation. No. But the basic question, really, I guess, is. The, Partly who's paying for it, but where's the water coming from? Okay, three parts. Let, let me just answer it very quickly. The situation is, they were going to re-green their bit that they were going to fence off. That's what I showed you, which was that triangle at 42%. We were going to re-green the whole oval with the existing irrigation repair. We were going to put a quarter of a million dollars worth of water tanks underground next to the oval, and the water was going to come from runoff off the sports hall, runoff from the car park, and our bore on site that we have at Brindabella with licences from Sport and Rec that have unlimited use on it and the portable water that they're draining from the creek coming back into the back end of line and primary in the corner, left hand corner. So it's going to be those three water sources. So you were planning to pay for the... We were going to pay for the infrastructure to get it ready and get it working and then they were going to upkeep it by mowing it. <laughs> And fertilising it and forever and a day. Um, I think we're going back to concentrating on one particular thing that the place is useless without being a green irrigated site. And, and that is simply not the case. Half it already is green and irrigated. Primary school kids use it all the time. I'm quite sure they'd be very happy for a Christian College to use that area 
to when they're not. I'm sure that can be worked out. But that is one element in many elements that one considers when you do a proper master plan for a place. It is just one. Okay, sorry. So, um, I'm a, I'm a uh, O'Connor resident. I only came along because I got the letterbox uh, drop from the Lyman Community Association, which kind of disturbed me a bit about how negative it was, to be honest. So I've come in very late in the process, obviously. <laughs> I'm really sorry to hear that it's uh, been decided or a decision has been made, because I agree it's a lost opportunity. Um, you, you put the photos of Franklin up there showing how great the crib is. That, that, that is really good, and it's good the government's investing in that open space, and it's a shame we don't have it yet in the old suburbs. But if you looked at the amount of open space that there is in O'Connor and Lynham, I think you'll find it's huge compared to Franklin. There's, oh. there's plenty of places to... Mm. to you might not be corrected. Anyway. Uh, I'd love to be uh, corrected. In fact, I'd take on the role of doing that if you like. Uh, so I'll do a measure for you and come back to this meeting. So I don't know the numbers, but I'd be very surprised if I'm wrong. Uh, I would have thought there's lots of places to walk, meditate in Lyme O'Connor. You look at the whole Sullivan's Creek catchment uh, corridor with the... Uh, the trees, you look at the wetlands, you look at the sports ovals, you know, I think there's a huge amount of space and here we are arguing about 10% of an oval for one of our communities. I think right. Okay, okay. Well, whatever the figure is. Yeah, I think it's a small amount. If I compare it to the amount of open space we have in Lyndon O'Connor in what is an education and sports precinct with a education provider, okay, we all might have our different views on private public education, but they're, they're a stakeholder in the community as well, so my point of view is I think it's a lost opportunity. I, one of the things I am concerned about is when things come in the email about the school making a profit. I mean, it's, as I just heard, it's a not-for-profit organisation that invests the money back in the school, so I'm wondering how that gets onto a flyer. Um, I wonder why the issue, if the issue is open space, why does the issue of a peppercorn rent come into the, into the discussion? As I understand it, all schools in the AC, all private schools in the ACT are granted the land. It's the norm. They do have great land granted a peppercorn rent. We have no argument with that whatsoever. So why, and my question why, is why, why is it part of the argument? If the argument is open space, let's mention the open space and have a good look at that. I, I agree, the master plan is a good idea, but to say there's no master plan, therefore we can't proceed with something that is now a lost opportunity, I think is a shame. In response to that, a couple of factors. <coughs> if, you look, if you just did a, a, an area calculation of the size of the suburb and the amount of open space it's gone, that's one thing. But you can't run a stamp that all over the place. Sure, I understand. If you look to the future, you need to look at housing density as well. And I, I urge you to have a look at things like the Hart Foundation, um, papers on it. I urge you to have a look at, um, at things like the City of Sturt has done some excellent publications on the importance and quality and type and nature of open space relative to housing density. So has Brisbane City Council, uh, so has the Queensland Government, and so have cities all over the world. So has the ACT government. Well, we see no evidence of it being translated onto the ground with regard to this issue. Okay, great. Very simple. <coughs> we had a firm proposal on the ground to protect that oval. What that is, don't get me wrong, Rob, is pie in the sky. That'll be in the never, never into the future. So, what it is, is a, it is a lost opportunity because there's a lot of dreaming that goes on. We worked two years to pull, pull this thing off. And the government came along reluctantly to actually go and re-green the oval because it was priority number 30-something in 40 ovals that have been turned off. <coughs> and because of all the money invested in Southall Park, there is no interest in Lynham. But Greg, the assumptions you're making there... They're not assumptions. ...is that the community wants a green oval. Oh, sorry, OK. Three thousand kids do. <laughs> so, so, okay. Um, half of green already. Okay. Start. Next question. <laughs> yeah, so this topic has an argument more than a question.
question, but the 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 the, 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 the grant there's no, nothing stop Bring the Bella from from no one complained if Bring the Bella put in the money to irrigate the article. The building that Bring the Bella is going to build is going to be built whether it's on public land or not. That was said by public meetings. The first one they said they're going to put in front of the school. The second one they're going to put it at the so these are furphies. Mm. If Brenda Bella wants to contribute to the to the irrigation of the oval, they can. But what they want is public land, mm. and that's what the problem about. So they're introducing these things about, oh, you won't, we'll only do the irrigation if you give us the public land. Why? Why can't they do the irrigation whether they get the public land or not? Their building is going to be built whether they get the public land or not. So it, all it is is a hard-nosed thing. Give us this land for free from the public or else. Okay. Okay. Can I answer? Yeah, sure. So for, for starters, the building could 100% be built on already land that we have leased from the government, which is currently car parks. So that's a furphy, right? At the end of the day, we already have 8% that is part of the BR. We have, we, we, that will always remain. So whether it's a tarred car park or a building sitting on top of it is highly irrelevant. We were trying to avoid building a major building while we've got 800 kids rattling around in the school because it's dangerous and we lost one kid already to a tree branch falling and it devastated the college. So for us, what it was was a clever way of building the infrastructure in a way that we could move around the site, predominantly on land that we already leased. The additional 10% had to do with moving the car parking around and trying to get a kiss and drop going between Lyman Primary and Rindabella. So the whole thing was an evolution. It didn't involve as a land grab, it evolved on the basis of what was smart. And so, yeah, look, to, don't get me wrong, what will end up happening is um, we'll have our architects work through um, building it differently, um, back on site again. Um, that's not an issue. The, the truth of the matter is, we, irrigating the, the, irrigating the park is, is not the issue. It's maintaining it. Mm. So the issue fundamentally is yes. it was a win-win for both parties and the government was playing. So I'm sorry, but that's an oversimplification. I'm sure the government will still run the irrigation system if you offer to put it in. Why, why, do you have, why do you have to get the land for you to put the irrigation system? The two things are unconnected. Sorry, when you look at the land we're actually talking about, against because it's a misnomer that the existing 8% knocks off a huge chunk. When you take the Tams car park out, we were going to regreen a six metre verge down Brigolo, get rid of all that temporary car parking so people could walk straight down to line of shops along that footpath instead of that dog leg that goes out around that small car park. So we were going to regreen it under, underneath the trees, move the car park back, create a kiss and drop for both schools. That was the whole plan. And in all that, when you build those larger car parks and you build the building, you get the water catchment because we we're going to retain rainwater in a quarter of a million dollars worth of underground tanks. So it's not it's not a one size fits all. It's it was a component thing that was driven and evolved. So again, I say it's an oversimplification of the exercise. Sorry, Ron. I don't know. I, I don't want this to. Okay. No, can I guess I could just follow on that just very quickly. That just was interesting. So, if I understand it, you're saying, why not just do, I mean, re green the oval and you don't have to worry about the rest of it? Is that right? No, I, I'm saying that the, the two things aren't connected. Okay, re green yeah, the yeah. oval without, if Brenda Bella wanted to contribute to re green the oval, they could. And I'm, I expect yeah. the government would accept the money. And if they don't have to own the land to re green the oval, they can put the, the, the government, or let them, well, the government would put the tanks in, or they can put the tanks in on the government land. It's all about getting public land. And on the earlier thing, which keeps getting emphasised about the existing car park, uh, quite uh, about six years ago, nobody in the... There would have been the same reaction there was this time, I'm quite confident. Had anyone known that six years ago we were going to lose a big chunk of the oval, all we saw was graders turn up one day and spread gravel across the oval. That's all that the people that were lived there saw. And, and we've had this gravel... Car, horrible gravel car park there for six years on what was previously a very nice piece of oval. And it's nobody knew it was coming and it just, just came one day. Do you blame Brindabella College or the government for that? It shouldn't have happened. I mean, Brindabella College asked for it, the government shouldn't have agreed. So I blame the government. Mm -hmm. but, but, but it shouldn't have, it shouldn't have, it shouldn't have been allowed to occur. 
And we're never going to get that land back, as has been emphasised by Greg today. That land is gone now forever. It'll never come back. They now regard it as their land, even though they were given for it for car parking. Sorry, it's not our land. But let me explain something. That, that is open urban car park. Sorry, it's an open urban car park. When we actually finish the car park off, anyone can park there. It's not exclusive for the school. You just told us it's your land to put a building on now. So no, it's not a car park. I didn't say that. I said, no, I didn't say that. I said we were going to enter into a long term lease with the government to build a building there. We weren't, we don't, that is a, that is a leased arrangement. That car park is a leased arrangement. What I said was it's connected to the building education revolution. So when they granted the land, it became part of that, right? So what occurred is that car park is part of that arrangement. What I'm saying is, when we go to Tara, it'll still be a leased arrangement, it might be an owned arrangement. If we we're going to build a building on it, it'll still be a leased arrangement, not an owned arrangement. The issue is that that 8% by volume across the oval, that went a number of years ago. Now, it's that... Secret, then. If we found out, we would have tried to stop it. You, okay, the government at the time had a had an absolute passion to get as much money as it could from the building education revolution funding from the Commonwealth. And when you had back-to-back -back labour, everyone was complimentary in doing things together. And we actually said, we can't do this unless we do that, and they agreed to it. But they didn't tell us, and, and we're the ones that use the oath. Because... Oh, okay, 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 we've got another question coming here. So, right over here. Yeah. Talk to yeah. 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 New topic. I haven't um, followed this very closely, and when I listened to both stories, or both sides of the story, what I took into account was the fact that there were one or two polls where those polled were again it. And I thought, okay, well, this is probably a fair thing. The government's acted on the, um, the preponderance of no's. This gentleman raised an interesting point about a negative letter he received. I'm wondering here, and the question is directed to Greg, is the elephant in the room here a perception that the Lion and Residence Association, for want of a better expression, ran a dirty campaign whereby the no votes got um, uh, no. presidents? And if that's the case, is the purpose of this meeting to work out a better consultation process? Okay. No, look, I've, I've resolved, sorry, I resigned to the fact that back in November last year when 8 to 10 people and 100 people were quite vocal against it, right, we pulled the DA. Since that time we've been talking to the man standing up the back of the room, right, who was the chair of the Lyman Community Association, Dennis O'Brien, right. Now, Dennis has been quite silent all of this sitting in the back of the room quite silently. We, 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 we agree to disagree. We've had an excellent relationship <coughs> working for the last year trying to get to this end point. Right? Um, what it was, was there was misinformation about the truth that was selectively distributed in a fashion that didn't cover the actual facts of what was going on. So it wasn't a dirty campaign by the Lyman Community Association at all. They adopted a no position later in the piece, more recently, right? And, and that's something that evolved. In the early stages, Dennis was sitting around a table with uh, Sport and Rec. Rob was there too, right? So we're in a situation where we got to the second community consultation together. It, it went, it, it veered off after the actual petition. And as Shane Rattenbury said, um, his senior staffer said, on the face value of commercial organisations ripping up green space, you'd sign it. Look, I'd sign it too if I, if I actually read it on face value, right? So that wasn't the argument. So what it came down to, I've never considered Lyman Community Association and its executive to run it, be running a, a dirty campaign. I believe that the residents who voted may have voted on the wrong subject in a, in, a, in a substantive proportion of the case had they understood what was really at stake. But m maybe I'm wrong. That's just my opinion. So you're saying that there was a misrepresentation? In some of the data that was distributed, yes. Mm -hmm. and so and what was that? Well, as I just said to you, it was the, the fact that there was a petition of 1500 where 
what it's picking up on, we share at the NCCC issues associated with governments making decisions where it's actually ripping into space. This section 72 that we're sitting on is a current problem for the NCCC. And we actually have gone to meetings where we have been sold a pup. We've walked into a meeting that was meant to be a negotiation, walked out and there were embargoed press releases. Right? I said, I said to Mike, I said, no one's lifting a pen in this room, right, to actually take notes on what's being said. And so we walked out and there's embargoed documents ready to go out saying, giving the impression of the NCCC, the Dixon and Downer Association by having gone to the meeting, sort of gave the meeting a tick. <laughs> I don't understand the relationship between what you're saying. No. It's the same thing. What I'm saying is if you've got a 1500 signed petition that says large-scale corporations, you know, ripping into urban groups, we were protecting an oval. We wanted to re it. We wanted to protect it for 3,000 kids. It wasn't a large-scale corporation building townhouses. You're going to have 200 apartments built here on this Section 72 mm -hmm. and climbing. And we went to a meeting the other day where they want to rip the car park back at the back of the, the swimming pool. So what I'm saying is it wasn't that. It didn't start out like that, and it's not what Dennis and I spoke about over the last year. So right, could I put a question to you both in terms of how would you, I would also like to know how would you both see the process ameliorated? Because to me, it sounds like a stuff-up. <coughs> And I think that you really, I think, I, I think you both probably have taken a lot of learnings from this, using that word Absolutely. In, a, in a very cliched way, but I tend to think that you both now have sat on a, or sat through what would I, I pick, uh, pick up as a rather painful process. And, you know, this, I, I don't believe there's always win winners mm. in the situation, um, but this to me sounds like a win and a loss. And I think that we, as a North Canberra Community Council, we learn a lot about how to improve the situation. I would also add a caveat to that, and that is that I tend to think that this is not the impasse you both think. I still, maybe I'm a crazy optimist, but I tend to think there's probably a way forward that may meet both your... And that would take a much wiser person than, than I know, and certainly I'm not... That, that could bring something out of this. But first of all, leave that... We can park that. I'd like to know how you would improve that. Sorry to butt in and, and if you wanted to respond that. I, I, I just think that we need, as a community council, to know how to do it better. Absolutely. Do it better. And at the end of my presentation there, I mentioned that we are currently our energies are being put into finding a model of community consultation that doesn't certainly doesn't repeat what's happened here. Mm -hmm but find a constructive way forward. And I think that uh, that's the lesson we've learned. You, you've got an opportunity here that's very time critical, if you can save it at all. Time critical? Yeah, if the, the money runs out next October. 800,000 yeah. runs out. Yeah. 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 800,000 runs out. Yeah. 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 The, yeah. That I, the, the, the difficulty I have is this concept of protecting the oval by building on it. <laughs> I don't get that. Yeah. I, I, I have difficulty with that Let's concept. Let's take a step back from that. Well, that was my yes, I chance know. to respond. But I, I, I just, I'm, into something else. I'd also like to know um, your, your ways. You, you, you've said that your last slide showed one way going forward, so you're trying to look at collaboration in the long run here, collaborative way of going forward. And it would be nice to hear some articulation about the steps that you'd actually propose in, in relation to that. Um, uh, yeah. uh, in, a more details, in, a more detail, in a more detailed way. In a more detailed Perhaps another session here. Yeah, because, I think so. Um, because we just didn't have time for no. like 10 minutes. We're no. just introducing it. We're only just evolving it. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, right. Work in progress. Uh, it's early days. But, but on the, uh, yeah, I just wanted to go back for a chance to respond to this. This idea that you're protecting something by developing on it is, uh, I'm struggling with it. Um, I can understand. Um, Greening Noble is, is beneficial, I'm sure it would be like to do that. But I don't understand the protection thing because it's PRZ1 land, it, for it to be used for any other purpose, would require uh, a change in the territory plan and a change of its lease purpose clause. And uh, as I said in that presentation, 
uh, <coughs> the land is getting more precious every time a new apartment gets built in our suburb. And I think that's, you've got to, talk about future proofing, and I've heard that phrase come up. Future proofing is about looking to the future and then working out what's going to be needed 10, 5, 10, 20 years time. Not what's available today. And in fact, you said to yourself, we want to get this through before that process starts, I mean, months and months ago. And um, that, that's why. It's, it's not about to say so you lose $800,000 of develop money, development money. I know that's a lot of money. But it's a lot less than losing land, which may be very precious for future communities. That's why you need a master plan. Go ahead. Can I, can I just suggest, though, that it's not always about quantity. It is about quality and access to the open space as well. Absolutely. And again, so, you know, when we're talking about... I, I understand you have a difference of opinion on people's need for irrigated space. <coughs> uh, but here we're talking about an educational facility nibbling into it uh, that's going to front it, going to activate it. Uh, it had government Reduce support... It. It reduced it, I accept that, but what I'm saying is it's not always about amount, it is about the whole picture. So here we have an educational facility that's actually providing a sporting facility on the sporting facility land, by the way. It's an, okay, it's an indoor sports facility, but still a sports facility if you're interested in health and wellbeing. Accessible by whom? Uh, so, look, as I said, I've come into this process late. I understand it was going to, well, firstly, it's accessible to the children of the school. Which yeah. school? Bring the Bella Christian College. Thanks, Mr. President. Is there more statements? important material that should be discussed at the moment, like what's proposed for this area? Mm. Because you no, and Greg, like Greg seem to be privy to something that I think could be of assistance uh, to all of us and might also touch on this issue. Well, I don't really have anything planned on the agenda. Uh, well, we... On, on, we have, um, yeah, we have I think a couple of these topics going on long yeah. enough because most people in here, I don't think, are interested in this, really. Well, <laughs> I mean, he just brought up a thing there. I'll say something. I like saying something yeah. down there. He brought up about there putting a building on an oval. I used to go to Derrimal and College. You look at Derrimal and College now, every second year they put another building on it. The oval there is two ovals left. I mean, I agree with this gentleman here. You've got green space. Don't put buildings on it. There are Marlins doing it. In 20 years' time, they'll have no green space left on their little block of land for the kids to do things on. It'll be all buildings. That's my thing of it. I mean, I wasn't involved in this, and I, no, I think this discussion's more than Well, I, want, I do have a good point. point. I think, uh, does anyone else have any questions, first of all? No, okay. I just had one question myself, because it's one thing I've been thinking about, and this really for both sides. What, uh, originally I was thinking, what would you say would be the future of line and mobile of your side won versus your side lost? And I was interested to see you know, how you know, both the optimistic and pessimistic <coughs> assessments. So given what we have now, I'm curious, and this is the final question, what do each of you see the future being of line and neighborhood Well, I'll go first. Yeah. I, I see it as being... Uh, open green space that is uh, in the heart of Lynham. It's part of a linear network, which in this case is the uh, Sullivan's Creek Corridor, which is also a major transit corridor in itself for bicycles. It's the busiest one in Canberra. Um, I see it as uh, being planned to satisfy the requirements of the schools that are there, uh, which is very important. I see it being established and planned to satisfy the requirements of the present population of Lyon. And perhaps most importantly, I see it being there and planned appropriately for the future populations of Lyon, which are set to expand dramatically. And that is very important because to not do that is to repeat the mistakes that many cities have done. If you go to Sydney and you look at how some of the suburbs with their multi-storey red brick flats that are now 50, 60 years old, 
They're ghettos. If you look at the big cities around the world, they, they're pulling them down, left, right and centre, and sometimes they're replacing them with parks, and they're producing urban spaces that are livable and lovable and healthy for people. You don't get that without planning for the future. We have seen no indication from the government and no indication through this particular process um, involving the, school, the Christian school of that happening. The planning is coming. We know it's coming because they've sent out briefs for consultants to engage those plans. Let's see what the result of that planning is before we do anything. Thanks, Greg. Well, I've sat working with the Community Council for a substantial period of time. I've watched the LDA do what it does. I've watched the various different parts of government do what it does. And I've seen the results of what that negotiation has sort of ended up being. And um, I know you say 27 trees at the back of the pool, um, albeit it now looks temporary and that's where you want to get to in the conversation. Um, it's a bit of a watch this space. I don't share your optimism in relation to the space. I know that uh, before I came along two and a half years ago, it was being, well, a huge chunk of it was being land banked for line and primary. Um, yeah, but I, I, I wish you well in noble thoughts. I think that the planning process, unless we get a government that is actually, actually engaged with community councils, and the will of people in terms of their local areas, I think that the planning will be frustrating. And uh, we'll do the best we can to try and stop it, you know, bad decisions where they can they come up. But um, I think it's uh, a little bit uh, optimistic to think that um, it's going to turn into what you think it's going to Someone's got to pay for it. So, and at the moment, in the foreseeable future, I can't see that. Well, if millions and millions of dollars are poured into residential development in our suburb, mm -hmm. currently that money goes into consolidated revenue. Mm -hmm. Elsewhere in the country, particularly in South Australia and New South Wales, which has its Section 94 contributions, money, when somebody wants to develop something, they need to either set aside money and give it to the local council, or they need to provide facilities um, for the suburb to support not just the building they're building for the people to live in, but to support the whole community, uh, so that there is for, there are footpaths, there are playgrounds. He's talking about cities that have other sources of income. <laughs> this town makes its money out of rates, services, taxes, and stamp duty, which you okay, are <laughs> I think, okay, it's starting to sort of crumble down here, so I think uh, let's wind it up yeah. and just say thanks to both Rob and Greg for giving us some time.